Hello, everyone, and welcome back to English 1120 Time in History in Literature. It's lecture nine. Uh, tonight, we're going to take a look at Milton's Paradise Lost for, for part two of our look at uh, Milton's uh, epic poem. As I said last week, a poem that has really resonated throughout the tradition in terms of being a real center of gravity for the canon people. Uh, writers uh, after Milton end up having to refer to him in some way. Last time we talked about a bit of the historical context of Milton as an author, uh, particularly the political context. We, we mentioned that his, uh, his Republican leanings, his participation in the Commonwealth government. We had a bit of a chance to talk about how that might influence how we interpret the figure of Satan as, as potentially someone who is uh, similarly a, a person who, or a, at least an angel, a fallen angel who revolts against, to his mind, tyrannical authority. We also talked about, let's say, the contrary opinion that what I would call an orthodox interpretation of the poem that sees uh, the poem as educating us, that tries to, to see any temptation we have to sympathize with the satanic view as part of the education process. We're drawn in to, to sympathize with Satan only to learn later that we, we need to take a, a higher perspective on these, uh, on these questions. So tonight I want to uh, continue book one. We had a chance to look at the invocation in the first 80 lines or so of book one. I want to finish book one and discuss book two if we have time. And uh, in the course of discussing the first two books, we'll have a chance to talk about in passing some of the occurrences and themes in the other books as well, but we won't have a chance to read them as closely, but we'll give you a an opportunity to see what a close reading of the other ones could look like. Without further ado, I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation here that can guide us. So, the, so as I said, we, we already started to talk about the invocation, we talked about the context. So right now I wanna talk about how Milton in, uh, in his epic similes, we talked about the invocation already a, uh, a bit in terms of how it does this, but Milton's writing is evoking a tradition. So there's traditional conventions of the epic that Milton adheres to, in some senses surpasses, tries to outdo, but in every, in every instance is always within a tradition. Now I want to contrast that with a more, I'll, I'll call it post-romantic view of creative originality that we have to totally create de nouveau, that we can't at all be tied to traditional forms or, or, or uh, themes that preceded us in the past. So this would be something, um, the, the type of originality that we'll see in Milton next week, i sorry, in, in Wordsworth next week and the Romantic Poets, <clears throat> but which Milton doesn't really adhere to, okay? So we have to keep that to one side. So what I want to, to underline is that for Milton, being tied to the restraints, let's say, of a tradition is freeing. So that's what I say, the uh, conventions the conventions that he's adhered to, adhering to rather than restraining his creativity are liberating, okay? So he, he, he sets himself this task of, of trying to write and outdo some of the epics of this tradition. And he says in the first few lines, lines that we read last week, that, that with his Christian news, he can, uh, he, he wants that Christian muse to aid him 
in his adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian Mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. So he wants to be able to outdo them in that way. Um, I think I mentioned this last week, Northrop Fry, a Canadian critic, calls Milton's work the story of all things from, from before creation of the cosmos to the end of, of days. Um, so we can contrast this expansive scope with the novel, okay? So Milton's great epic is, is really the last epic. Um, after, after Milton's epic, the last epic that, of any note that, that people still read, after Milton's epic, what kind of replaced epic as a genre for telling narratives was the novel. So it went from poetry to prose, and it went to this, this newish genre called the novel, okay? So I won't talk about the novel genre too much right now, but um, we'll end up obviously talking about a novel when we talk about Mrs. Dalloway, Virginia Woolf's uh, novel written in 1925. But uh, the novel as a genre had really started and come into its own in the beginning of the 18th century. So just after Milton's epic, which was written the second edition in 1674. So as I said here, this epic, Milton's epic is telling the story of all time, all, everything from the beginning to the end. And then I'm gonna remind you of a, of a slide I think I shared with you <clears throat> earlier in the course uh, about the condensation of story time in the last few hundred years of, of novels. So this is a, a study that I'm very fond of by Ted Underwood uh, uh, called uh, Why Literary Time is Measured in Minutes. And he and his team went through uh, a number of, uh, of novels in that period to get data points. So the data, their data points were by taking 16 random spots in a novel, read a page of the of the narrative there, and then try to try to estimate how much story time elapsed. Okay, so remember the difference between narrative time and story time. So if I read a page of text, let's say it talk, takes me two, two minutes to read that, depending on how dense the words are, um, then that narrative time is, is a certain amount of time, a couple minutes. But the story time could be, they could have talked about the character doing something that took four days, a week, what have you. So over the period of from early 18th century to the early uh, 20, uh, early 21st century, you can see quite a decline. And I'll, I'll note that this is an, on the, on the y-axis is a logarithmic scale. So the decline is more severe than you, you might otherwise think. So there's quite a decline in the story time that's represented in about one page of narrative discourse in a novel over that period of time. So try to compare that to maybe a page of Milton that covers millennia or the creation of the universe or the whole history from from judges to to Maccabees or something like that if, if we're if we're talking about uh, the later books where Michael is um, giving uh, giving Adam and Eve a for Adam a foreshadowing of the future uh, biblical history so all that to say to put into perspective the kind of the kind of grand grandiose vision that Milton's able to portray in this work compared to the types of narratives we're, we're more used to in the last few hundred years. Okay, so our our narratives are used to uh, looking in and dwelling at small moments of subjective experience of of the self. So spending time on how I experience this cup of coffee or waiting in and who's that coming into the diner and, or the cafe and that person looks strange. So that subjective experience and dwelling over these minute details of consciousness is really where narrative really hit its sweet spot, so to speak, 
in the novel in the last last 150 years or so. Um, even at the beginning of the novel, something like Robinson Crusoe, um, it was published in 1719, uh, if memory serves. So Robinson Crusoe, famous story of, of someone shipwrecked, uh, uh, the title character shipwrecked for, uh, I think, what's 28 years or something like that, if memory serves, on uh, this deserted island, uh, makes his way through there, through ingenuity, finds faith, finally finds his way off the island. There, according to Ted Underwood's analysis, the average page of narration there has or, or depicts about four and a half days of, of story time, okay? So in the time between Robinson Crusoe and a novel written more recently, we have a hundredfold compression of story time, okay? So I won't dwell on that any anymore. We'll come back to that probably when we talk about Virginia Woolf. But remember, we're, we're off the charts when we're talking about Milton. We're talking about eons or time, time that's unmeasurable. Okay, so, so Milton felt that by following the conventions of the poetic tradition, the paths established by wise authors before him, he had a certain liberty. Okay, so he says um, another convention in the... Um, in the verse um, uh, introduction or, or preface that he had affixed to the, the second edition of Paradise Lost, he, he defends the fact that it's blank verse, uh, so non-rhyming verse, okay? So some people, when the, the first edition came out in 1667, had questioned this, why is it not rhyming, okay? And Milton defends it by turning, by referring to Homer and Virgil, whose uh, epics did not rhyme. They, they were in, uh, uh, they were in uh, dactylic hexameter, uh, non-rhyming. Uh, so the, the, the poetic quality is from the rhythm, okay? And so too, he says, uh, you know, our, our, our recent English tragedies followed that. So if you know your Shakespeare, again, there's, there's poetic rhythm to the line and uh, often, often in, uh, in uh, pentameter, um, iambic pentameter, but not necessarily rhyming. So he refers to these as, uh, especially, you know, Virgil and Homer as examples of, or trying to re recapture that tradition as, it, as a way to recover an ancient liberty, okay? An old liberty that these ancient poets had that has been lost by people who've been trying to put on rhyming as this kind of jingling and jangling uh, in a poem that's that's not needed. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, so it's beginning with the Romantics. So there we're talking around the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century. We have creative freedom being construed in, construed in a sense of being free from restraints, okay? So, so Milton, the liberty he's talking about is an ancient liberty where he's picking up just different rules. There's still rules, right? It's not, don't give me any restraints. Give me these old rules, okay, that, that have more authority. Um, and in the classical tradition, liberty is not construed as a freedom from restraint. It's considered a free to. So someone is free to live up to their end. Okay, so in um, in moral philosophy, uh, moral and political philosophy, when when considering liberty, we could uh, we can do uh, the kind of thought experiment about you know or or question around whether or not it would be right if someone we know and cared about had a, a severe heroin addiction or something like this. So they're absolutely a slave to the drug, right? They've lost their free choice in all respects. Um, and if we were to, to do an intervention and force them to go into some sort of rehab so that they could kind of gain their life back, is that robbing them of their freedom? Okay, so to some extent, <clears throat> to some extent, you know, uh, unless they've broken the law, 
legally speaking, in, a, in, in our kind of modern liberal societies, we would say, no, you, that person has to decide for themselves. They, they, can't, they can't be forced to do these things. It's their choice. So uh, um, the traditional, let's say the classical notion of liberty would say, well, what freedom does that person really have? Like, so what, that person is not free to be who they are in their essence. In fact, their, 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 their personhood is being completely robbed. So, um, oh. so we have uh, a choice whether to let that person's liberty continue to be stolen from them or to make this intervention that allows them to grow to their potential, okay? So that part of the classical, classical notion of liberty is, is that people have an essence and a goal to attain, so to speak. So that also is gone. We don't have any goals other than our own self-directed goals, right? So, um, so in the, the classical notion, it, it kind of has an organic, there's a core organic metaphor there. So, um, and so I like to think of it, uh, and forgive me if I've given you this analogy before, because it's one of my favorites. I'm not a very good gardener, but I, the one time I uh, tried to, to grow some tomato plants many years ago. And uh, I noticed, you know, you, you had to, after the first, first attempt failed and they all died that you had to use a stake. So you had to put these stakes next to each plant and tie the plant as it grows along this stake. So this stake is really restricting where this tomato plant can go, right? So the tomato plant is really being forced to grow in a certain path. Um, now, the, it's the path that is the most profitable for that tomato plant. It's the only path with which in which that path, that, that tomato plant can grow and bear fruit to like, can grow to its end of producing fruit, so to speak, okay? So if you leave it completely free to its own devices, so to speak, kind of like the heroin addict, then it's free to die. It just languishes on the ground and dies is exactly what happens like the heroin addict. So, so I think in the, as I said, in the classical tradition, the notion of freedom is kind of akin to tying the tomato steak so that it can achieve its end, its, its, its fruit. Um, and remember fruit here as, as the effect, as the benefit, the product kind of like of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree. Um, the first line of Milton's epic, of course. <clears throat> so, so, so for the classical notion of liberty, it's akin to that. Um, now, now, Milton had the same, same notion of liberty at mind when he was talking about in adhering to the rules of a poetic tradition, he's being freed to express himself. He's being freed to a higher purpose or his, his higher end, okay? So, so in following these epic conventions, he's able to express more than if he had had no tomato steak of form to follow, right? So the, the epic conventions are giving him things that he has to kind of follow, kind of like the tomato steak, but it's allowing him to flourish and to produce the, the fruit of this epic poetry. <clears throat> Excuse me, one, one example I always like to refer to are the, um, epic similes. So a lot of the ep epic similes, we had an opportunity to look at one last week, okay? We looked at one where, you know, we can see Milton's expansive epic similes at work, where he can refer to both the, uh, the, the, the Greek tradition, the, the Hebrew tradition, and um, there was even an, a simile within a simile in that example. So, so here's another example of one of his epic similes, where, where in this case, it's not so much the expansive nature of the simile that I want to point out, but I want to point out how he's consciously echoing all of the previous epics in the tradition in just these few lines. And, and in that echoing, how much more rich he can make those lines, how much more resonance is in those lines, because underneath that, those five lines that we're about to read, 
there is that whole tradition. And we're reminded of the same or similar lines by Homer, Virgil, and Dante. So this is in book one, um, the, the reference to the fallen angels that are lying on the burning lake and uh, they're compared to fallen leaves, okay? So Satan stood and called his legions, angel forms who lay entranced, thick as a th autumnal leaves that strow the brooks in Valambrosa, where the Etrurian shades high overarched embower. So, so they're, they're compared to a, a, a river, a brook with, with you know, a beautiful trees that hang over them. And this is in this valley of Valambrosa, and these leaves fall onto the river just, and, and the fallen angels are like those leaves as they float on the burning lake, as the, as the fallen angels float on the burning lake, okay? <clears throat> now, this image calls to mind a similar image from Dante's uh, Inferno. So this is the third ca canto in the, the Inferno. As in the autumn, leaves detach themselves, first one and then the other, till the bough sees all its fallen garments on the ground. Similarly, the evil seed of Adam descended from the shoreline one by one, when signaled as a falcon called will come. So here in, in Dante's Inferno, he's describing a scene in hell. So just, just as Milton's describing a scene in hell, Milton's describing fallen angels, Dante's describing the souls of, of humans who've died and are in hell, are, are damned souls. So, so, but here too, they're being compared to, by Dante, to fallen leaves in autumn, okay? Then, of course, uh, in an episode we, we read in, in Virgil's Aeneid. So in Virgil's Aeneid, book six, you'll recall book six is when um, Aeneas, uh, descends to the underworld, guided by, by Sybil. Thick as the leaves in autumn strow the woods, or fowls by winter forest forsake the floods, and wing their hasty flight to happier lands, such and so thick the shivering army stands, and press for passage with extended hands. So the army is an army of, of, of again, dead souls in the underworld that are waiting for passage across the, the river Acheron uh, by the, uh, the boatman. And then finally in Homer, we didn't read the Iliad, but um, the, the, the Iliad uh, has a similar scene. So uh, uh, Glaucus uh, uh, gives the following defiant words to Diomedes, generations of men are like the leaves. In winter winds blow them down to earth but then when spring season comes again, the budding wood grows more. And so with men, one generation grows and other dies away. So, uh, so human life, again, compared to leaves, slightly different than the, the, the theme of, of Dante and, and, and Virgil, where in both cases they were in hell and, and dead souls were compared directly to, to leaves as they were in the other underworld. Here it's leaves in, in the, the, the upper world, so to speak, but the same, same kind of resonance. So, so again, my point there is that in that one epic simile and, and by adhering to the tradition, rather than that being some sort of constraint on, on Milton's ability to express himself, the fact that he, he has to refer to traditional models, has to refer to traditional forms, Rather than be, that being a constraint, it, it enables, it, it liberates, okay? <clears throat> so this, this type of image too, we're not gonna read this, but I do encourage you to read this, this work if you get a chance. It's uh, written in 19, or published in 1922. It's a probably, I don't know, the, the best example of modernists. So early 20th century, uh, poetry, uh, and T.S. Eliot tried to, in the wake of what he saw as kind of a fragmentation of the tradition, tries to say, okay, well, um, can I bring together the fragments of the tradition? Can I reignite the ability that, that, that a Milton had to reach back into the tradition and be able to say so much? So he, uh, so I think 
also, of course, wanted to use the same sort of image. So in the, the wasteland, he says, a crowd flowed over London Bridge so many, I had not thought death had done so many. So that's a reference to Dante's Inferno with the, again, those souls going over the river. The, the river's tent is broken. And then kind of a, the, 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 the metaphor here, the river's tent is broken, the last fingers of leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank. So uh, again, a river covered over with dead leaves. And uh, we have, without the explicit simile that we get in, in Milton and Dante and, and, and Virgil, but a similar reference to just by having them so, um, uh, having the reference to human souls so close by, a similar association of leaves with, with the, the falling away of human life. So now I want to go back to book one, and I want to talk a little bit more about Satan. He's been revolving around all of our discussions, but let's kind of go back to the beginning and, and uh, figure out, okay, what is the question and who is this figure? So the big question, as I said, is, is, is Satan really the hero of this work? And is are we as readers meant to sympathize with Satan, to see Satan as, as embodying a type of virtue, a type of virtue of resoluteness, of single-mindedness, of, of spirited revolt against tyranny that we're supposed to copy. So some people believe that. I, I, I don't think that's what's going on in this poem, but some people firmly believe that. Um, or on the other hand, as I, as I said, something I would probably see, see, a, see as a, a, probably a more cogent reading of the poem, are we to see Satan as, as kind of a, a negative example, a warning for us? This is where your pride can get you. It may look tempting now, but wait till the end of the poem. Okay, so a lot of the a lot of the emphases on Satan as a hero really focus on books one and two, which we'll be looking at because they're, you know, the exciting opening. It's where we see Satan, but he he has, a, you know, towards the end of the poem, this is a much less glamorous appearance. Okay. Um, so it was a problem for early readers as well, not just us. Um, so let's, let's, where does this figure come from? And, and, what did Milton have to access in terms of in terms of his own writing of Satan? Because in a, in a way, Milton before sorry, Satan before Milton is is quite a bit different. After Milton, our imagination about what Satan is is quite a bit different. It's quite a bit more dynamic. But this is what he was working with, at least. Um, so the the word devil, English word devil. Uh, as you can see, I'll, I won't go through all that, but it has a certain etymology that, of from Greek diabolos, which is a translation of uh, of the Hebrew shatan or Satan, which is adversary or obstructor. Okay, so it's it's uh, originally had just this kind of very general sense in the in the Hebrew Bible, and uh, the early references were to someone who kind of either prompts evil or opposes God's will. Because in the earliest writings of the Hebrew Bible, um, it's before the Hebrew people had, had, had adopted a strict um, monotheism. So there's remnants in the Hebrew Bible of, of references to a council of gods where, where um, either uh, uh, Elohim or or Yahweh, there's so there's different names of this God that they would be worshiping, is one of a member of this council. Okay, so depending on which strands of the tradition uh, that particular uh, text in the in the Hebrew Bible is picking up on, and then those are edited over generations. So you have different strands of that. And that, that becomes solidified into more and more of a, a let's say, a distinct figure. So, so if there's a council of gods and you have a kind of a, an opposer of humankind as one of the, 
the figures in that round table, then that becomes, you know, and, and maybe with, with no distinct name, then that, that, that comes to have a distinct name. And then it wasn't, and then in the intertestamental period, the figure of Satan really started to develop into a, a kind of concrete, uh, a concrete figure of evil, so to speak. So the intertestamental period is like the Hebrew Bible, basically up to, to Malachi, you know, the last of the prophets. And then, so there's a over a 400 year gap until the first texts of the, the Christian New Testament. So that's often referred to as the intertestamental period. So in that period, there, there's other texts and writings that, that would become deuterocanonical for, for Roman Catholics. And, and uh, there's other uh, traditions of interpreting the Hebrew Bible that are developing. Um, and in that period, the, uh, it was only in that period that the serpent of Genesis, okay, was associated with this figure of Satan. So we had this figure of Satan, which is this general obstructor of humankind. And in this period, they said, well, wonder if that's the same as the serpent that's in Genesis. So let's make them equal, okay? And then in that period, they, they took this other reference from Isaiah. So Isaiah written much earlier, um, uh, a, a reference to uh, the king of Babylon, and, and they, they just called, uh, used the word, or Isaiah used the word Lucifer, or uh, son of mourning for this, this uh, figure, in terms of kind of one warning prophecy that he had. And then he takes that, uh, sorry, in the intertestamental period, authors took that figure of Lucifer and attached it to Satan as well. So you start to get these strands pulled together in the intertestamental period that concretize Satan into this figure of evil in the intertestamental period. And it was picked up in early Christianity. Early Christianity had certain, I won't go into it in too much detail, but Gnostic Manichaean strands to it. So uh, that, that tended towards a, a kind of strict dualism, so to speak. So, so for, for a strict Manichaean view of the world, there's, a, there's an evil world of matter and a good world uh, of spirit. And we're, we're all divided by this and they're, they're, they're distinct forces, okay? So um, now this is distinct from, let's say, what, what is kind of an orthodox Christian doctrine, which is, you know, God is all powerful and evil is, is in essence, the absence of, of divine will. It's a, it's a non-entity because it's just the, the being so far removed from divine will that it's an experience of absence, okay? So it's not as though there's a distinct force out there that could overpower and sometimes beat good, you know, that kind of thing. But that's kind of the Manichaean view is that there's two opposed forces and, and evil will, will win sometimes. Now, so because early Christianity had that kind of Gnostic Manichaean influence, it really picked up this notion of, of Satan as this kind of, in the, in, in the mythology, picked up this notion of Satan as, as a kind of a distinct being, as being, um, as representing evil, as, as being a tempter in the garden, you know, that, like the serpent in the, um, in the, in the Genesis stories as being the force that brings evil in the world, so to speak. <clears throat> so, um, so that's what Milton's building on. And he builds on, so he builds on that Christian tradition. And he, um, and he uh, fleshes out, so to speak, that that's all he has really to go on. So everything about him being, having great speeches, and, and, and there were some poets, post new testament stories about you know uh about maybe a battle in 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 heaven and fallen angels and, and some extrapolations on that but the, really this whole story about having great speeches and rousing these different devils that's all created by milton so it's um it's it's kind of a mental imagery of satan that that he's created now the the other thing that he created around that is is making S satan this attractive leader, so to speak. So he, I want you to think about when we first see Aeneas in, in the Aeneid, okay? So he's, um, his, 
his comrades' ships. Some are lost. They've been through a terrible storm. It doesn't look, it looks like they've lost half their ships. It looks like they're not going to be able to get to Italy. They have no idea where they are. He gives a rousing speech to, to, um, to kind of bring up their spirits and say, well, you know, we're, we've been through worse, you know, we battled the Greeks, we did that, we can do this too. And, and um, uh, I forget what the narrator says, I'll try to find a note on it, but the narrator undercuts that by saying, you know, this was what he was saying on the outside, but on the inside, he was, he was also despairing. So he puts on a brave face, okay, in order to rouse the troops. So, so too, and I want to turn to that now. So too does Satan um, in his first speech, and it's just after, I think, where we left off last time. Um, oh, yeah, so I found a note here. So the narrator in Virgil's Aeneid, so after Aeneas has aroused the troops there, the narrator says, um, Brave words, sick with mounting cares, he assumes a look of hope and keeps his anguish buried in his heart. Okay, so here that's very clear that that's heroic. Okay, that's heroic in Virgil's Aeneid. That action of putting aside personal pain and assuming that personal pain in order to, you know, Aeneas is the pious one, the man of duty. He knows this is his duty. It, it, he's, he's not going to wallow in his own, his own misery and, and complain. He's going to swallow that. And I, he, Aeneas has a duty to lead those, those men and, and ensure for their safety. Now, let's, is that what's happening with Satan, I wonder? You know, so Satan's first speech, very similar situation. Um, it's, uh, we'll turn to that now. I'll stop sharing this and I'll share the uh, view of the text. So we had uh, read up to where his speech starts. So we had read last time this invocation of man's first disobedience, that first part up to and justify the ways of God to men. So remember that famous line 26. And then say first, for heaven hides nothing from thy view. So the, say first what caused this fall. And, and it was Satan. And he fell nine times the space that measures night and day. So they fell for nine days. And <clears throat> they're on a burning lake. And next to him was Beelzebub, to whom the arch enemy and thence in heaven called Satan with bold words, breaking the horrid silence began. So now these are words of Satan, okay? So Satan's first speech. So very similar situation to Aeneas. The crew's under, undergone hardship. It's, it's um, a, a, quite a desperate situation, first speech. If thou beest he, but oh, how fallen, how changed from him who in the happy realms of light clothed with transcendent brightness, did stout shine myriads though bright. If he who mutual league united thoughts and counsels equal hope and hazard in the glorious enterprise joined with me once, now misery hath joined in equal ruin. Into what pit thou seest from what height fallen, so much the stronger proved he with his thunder. Until then, who knew the force of those dire arms? Yet not for those, nor for what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change. Though changed in outward luster, that fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injured merit, that with the mightiest raised me to contend, and to the fierce contention brought along innumerable forces of spirits armed, that durst dislike his reign and me preferring, his utmost power with adverse power opposed in dubious ba battle on the plains of heaven and shook his throne. What though the field be lost, all is not lost. The, in the unconquerable will, the study of revenge, immortal hate and courage never to submit or yield. And what is else not to be overcome? 
that glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me to bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee and deify his power, who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire, that were low indeed, that were in ignominy and shame beneath this downfall. Since by fate the strength of gods in this imperial substance cannot fail, since through experience of this great event in arms not worse, in foresight much advanced, we may with more successful hope resolve to wage by force or guile eternal war irreconcilable to our grand foe, who now triumphs and in the excess of joy, soul reigning holds the tyranny in heaven. So that's the end of his first speech. And then the narrator comes. Remember the narrator's, the narrator's little kind of tag on to Aeneas's first speech. So here, so spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting loud, but racked with deep despair. Okay, so, uh, so but that could be taken two ways, right? So again, that can be taken as, that can be taken as, Heroic like Aeneas in swallowing his pain in order to try to, to, to put on a brave face for the team, so to speak. Okay, that's one. And then the other could be he's vaunting aloud, but he's not getting anywhere. He's racked with deep despair. These are all lies. This is part of the lies that is that is Satan and the, the lack of logic that is Satan. Okay, so we'll, we'll go back and to some of the to the to some of the speech so he he asks if thou beest he but oh how fallen so the outward luster of Beelzebub so different than when he was in heaven so he can't he can hardly recognize re recognize him um uh how changed from him who in the happy realms of light clothed with transcendent brightness did stout shine so even in that happy realm of light in heaven you beelzebub did outshine myriads uh so many even though they were bright if we who mutual league united thoughts and counsels equal hope and hazard in glorious enterprise so if if we who were in that mutual league and had hope and joined with joined once with me in that hope, now miseries joined us together in equal ruin. Okay, so at first it's not very rousing speech. You know, your boy, you've really, well, you really took it on the chin. You're totally disfigured now. You know, we were first united in equal hope. Uh, and you were united with me behind that, but now we're only united in equal ruin. It's totally, uh, it totally went to went to hell, literally. Um, into what pit thou seest from what height fallen? So much the stronger proved he with his thunder. So we, we fell from such a great height, and now we're in such a deep pit. Um, his, he, he proved so much stronger, he with his thunder, so God. And, and the sun, we find out in the war, in book six, there's a description of the war in heaven. And it's, it's really the sun uh, that, that, that wields this thunder. Uh, until then, who knew the force of those dire arms? Okay, so who knew until then? So, but you didn't, like, here's the logic, right? So, he, so, uh, so that can be tempting this rhetoric. We can get sucked into the satanic rhetoric of, oh, he's really trying and, and maybe you know, God's just a tyrant and, 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 and uh, kind of tempted their attempt as Satan tries to say, but it's, it's not as though someone, if, if, you know, someone has relationship to God and knows they're omnipotent, they don't have to have an arm wrestle with them to figure out that they're going to lose, right? You know, you don't, who knew how, who knew the force of those dire arms? Well, he's omnipotent. Um, yet not for those, nor for the potent victor, in his rage can else inflict, sorry, nor what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change? So not because of those dire arms, so those forceful arms, nor what else the potent, so powerful victor, God, can else inflict, not for that or for whatever else he's going to put us through, do I repent or change? So Milton's un, Satan is unrepentant still. He's not going to change. And there, here's another aspect that 
has a certain resonance for the people who are defenders of Satan is that Satan has is the one who represents a character of 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 strength of will. I'm not going to change. I I'm one of resolve. I have a will of resolve. Okay, um, I'm not going to be affected by external blows. I'm going to kind of marshal through. Um, <clears throat> Though changed in outward luster, that fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injured merit. So the mind is its own place and can make a heaven of hell, he says, he says later, can make in a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven, or it could be the other way around. I'm not, I always forget. Um, so the, the, the power of the mind to create its own place and space is also very satanic and it's very it's something you'd also hear from hamlet actually it's the sense of the of the infinite capacity of of one's kind of mental faculty and mental resolve um that with the mightiest raised me to contend and to the fierce contention brought along innumerable force of spirits so i there's all of that that sense of injured merit and that fixed resolve of that mental resolve that that brought me to contend with 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 my with my infinite or innumerable spirits that were on my side against uh, uh, omnipotent God. And those other spirits, the other fallen angels durst dislike his reign and me preferring so they disliked God's reign and preferred Satan, his utmost power with adverse power opposed in dubious battle. So dubious battle there can mean as a couple of senses. It's kind of like vain. Remember, we talked about vain having two senses. So vain means, you know, it's useless, but also it's self-centered or prideful. Here, dubious can mean the sense that we have of dubious, that it is, um, that it is of, uh, of doubtful importance, let's say, but also here of doubtful outcome outcome so here dubious satan i think wants to say something like you know it was close so before he was saying you know well who knew how powerful he was like he who could have overcome those it was just it's just incredible and then yeah well, we were close you know we, you know another shot i think we could have had it and uh, these are the kind of machinations and twists and turns of of thinking that will get get the fallen angels to decide that they want to go uh, another round, but just in, on a different ar arena, okay? On the plains of heaven and shook his throne. What though the field be lost, all is not lost. The unconquerable will, the study of revenge, immortal hate. So even though we lost that field, all is not lost. We still have our unconquerable will. We uh, we have the study of revenge. We can keep feeding on revenge. Now, if there's one thing in my limited experience I know that that is a recipe for a miserable existence is to, is to focus on resentment and revenge as a goal. Okay, I don't know. I don't really know that from a lot of personal experience. I'm not a vengeful person, but you get those times where you, you know, you're bitter at someone or something like that. Now, Feeding oneself on vengefulness, even if it's petty, the petty vengefulness that of, of someone who's cut you off, so you don't want to let them in on the next merge or something like that if you're on the freeway, that's the kind of bitterness that will never bring happiness to one's soul. So, so Satan is, that's what Satan brings to someone, is this focusing on on vengefulness and my injured merit it's it's pride centered so it's first of all it's pride it's pride that i deserved more i did, did and they didn't do that so go get them that is as i said a, a recipe for for the kind of hellish existence that satan is in and that's the kind of existence i think is the you know not just milton but every writer who writes against pride and against being resentful will we'll tell you leads human existence to that kind of help. Um, the immortal hate and courage never to submit or yield. And what else, and what is else not to be overcome? That glory shall never his wrath or might extort from me. Okay, so he's never going to be able to extort a 
the glory from me of capitulation. He's never going to be able to get the glory of truly defeating me, okay? Because I'm always going to keep going. That's what Satan's saying. To bow and sue for grace with suppliant me and deify his power. So I would never bow. It would be beneath me to sue for grace, like to, to sue for forgiveness or, or for, for the gift of, 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 uh, of, of grace. Um, who from the terror of this arm so late? So before it was the, the dire arms. And, and who knew how powerful the omnipotence dire arms were? And wow, that, you know, we really got our butts kicked and who knew how powerful he was? That was the opening. And now it's gone to just through his own kind of internal machination, Satan's led to, I would never bend my knee to that. Why would I ever do that? That would be beneath me. And why would I do it to someone who from the terror of this, of this um, arm so late doubted his empire? So the terror of these arms um, so recently doubted or feared for the outcome of his empire, okay? So he went from dubious to, you know, it was questionable about what outcome that's in his mind, right? I think underneath that, there's question of that that was like it was dubious in the sense that, you know, it was not worth it, right? Um, here now it's to... God was so it was so close he doubted for he feared that he was going to lose his empire in heaven. That were low indeed. That were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall. So it'd be so shameful. It would be a shame beneath this downfall. So it'd be worse than sitting in this fiery lake. It would be worse than this, this shame. So again, pride doesn't let that happen, right? So the person sitting in a burning lake, looking at an eternity of burning in his lake, right? So this thing, this is, you know, obviously, you know, let's say a mythical kind of literal implantation of a psychological state that we can all be in if we're fallen, let's say, as opposed to living, let's say, trying to free ourselves from pride, from resentment, okay? These types of things. So, so if, if one is afraid of shame, okay? So if I can say psychologically, I'm a, I, I don't I don't want the shame that would would come with saying I'm sorry I'm, I repent uh, to whoever it is, whether it's um, to to one's God or to to one's spouse or something like that. Then they're going to live, let's say, the psychological equivalent of you know kind of a burning lake of of misery for a long time, basically. But here it's so it's it's literal, it's been literalized to the extreme, right? It's so the person literally is, so Satan literally is in a burning lake. And the prospect is that that would be experienced forever. And still, it's a shame beneath this, okay? That would be a, a shame beneath this downfall. So it'd be worse than this downfall. So, uh, well, you know, maybe not, you know. Um, since by fate the strength of gods and this imperial substance cannot fail. So since I, we have strength of gods, like we're, we're angels, and that our imperial substance or our heaven-like substance cannot decay or fail, like we're going to be around. It's, it's kind of like a Marvel action movie. You know, they can get totally destroyed, but, you know, they're, they're, gonna, they're just going to dust off the dust again and, and stand up. Uh, because of this, and since through the experience of this great event, in arms not worse, in foresight much to advance. So, and we've gained experience. So we've got we've got the strength of gods. Our substance will not decay. We have a heavenly substance. We've had the experience of trying it twice. Where I'm sorry, we're once already. So we've already tried it. So we've gained experience. And in that experience, we didn't lose any arms. Like we're all still around. We have our weapons. But we gained foresight, so we know what to try and, and, and how to probe differently next time. Um, we may with more successful hope resolve to wage by force or guile eternal war, irreconcilable. So we can, um, with all those things, we know we can try with, uh, with, with more successful hope uh, to wage war by force 
or guile. So by open war or by trying deception and uh, uh, more covert methods. Now, I'm assuming that the note like eternal war, he's saying it's hopeful, like we're hopeful of success. Okay, but eternal war kind of means like, is, is this going to go forever? You know, like, uh, like the war on terror, is that going to just be forever? So eternal war to, uh, oops. I'm just going to I think I lost. Sorry about this. I just lost my. There we go. So. Uh, eternal war is to be implicitly doubtful about the prospects of victory. Yeah. So that's my point about that no notion of eternal war. Irreconcilable to our grand foe who now triumphs and in the excess of joy, soul reigning holds the tyranny of heaven. So uh, again, tyranny, we could take that as, as Milton's cue to us that, that Satan is, is a, a Republican hero against a tyrannical God, so to speak. But again, this, this, the, the perspective of Satan on these things is questionable. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, presentation. And I'll just, uh, so let's see. So we just, this is the speech we just, just read, 84 to 127. I won't go through all these, okay? We won't have time for that. But uh, this is the kind of thing, like I, I've highlighted some of the things you, you might want to look at in terms of sections, and um, we won't have time to go through together every one of these speeches. There's too much there, but you get an idea of uh, if you were to go by yourself, some of the things to think about, okay? And some of the ways to read it, okay? Um, we can see that, one of the things I want to want you to get from reading reading the the poem is the sense of our perspective on Satan. So, our early impression is that Satan is awe inspiring. He's depicted in these the sense of his uh, say his his gigantic size. His um, remember we looked at that similes compared to Leviathan, the hugest of the ocean. And then later, we, we didn't read it, but uh, when he gets up, he puts his spear on the ground to stabilize his steps on the burning, burning marl of the ground. And his spear is, is, is larger than, it makes the largest Norway pine seem like a toothpick. So, so it's, it's unimaginably big, right? So, so this is our perspective on Satan. If we approach from a fallen perspective. So we see him later as he goes into pandemonium. So uh, so just kind of I'll quickly recap what happens in book one is book one, we have those first speeches on the burning lake. Uh, after the invocation, uh, Satan and Beelzebub, you know, Satan says, okay, well, look, you know, it looks like the hail, the firing hail that was being sent from heaven has died down for a second. Let's try the profit of this occasion to get off the burning lake and get over to that kind of that ground over there and let's rouse the troops. Let's get them off of the burning lake. So and then they decide, let's uh, let's try to counsel. Let's have a council. Let's have a parliament of sorts to try to figure out what our best course of action is. So they build uh, what's called pandemonium. This is this great hall in hell where their discourses are going to be held. And the rest of book one is, is, is it, well, that's where book one ends. Book one, two opens with this council in hell, pandemonium, where they, we have different, uh, different discussions of, of uh, courses of action. Okay. So as they're going into pandemonium, they, they, they have to shrink to the size of bees, okay? So the, they, in order to get into this building, even though it's a grand hall, there's so many of them, they, they, they get to the size of like bees to, to get into these passages and all fit in. Now, so again, it's, it's a question of our perspective. Um, 
now they seem big, okay, now, but but from a different perspective, they can and they can seem small and insignificant, okay. A another point I want to make on that is is uh, the course of Satan throughout. He starts this noble leader Aeneas like with this rousing speech um, that everyone everyone responds to. Uh, his rhetoric is appealing. He's depicted as this martial hero with the spear and the shield. He then progressively like, changes to an eagle to first enter paradise or Eden, uh, then a serpent. And then finally, at the end, he's a serpent and can't change back. And when he goes, so, so I think this is in book 10, in book 10, when he goes back to hell to say, look, you know, everybody, I, uh, I, I did it. You know what we said, go and go and conquer the new world and and destroy humankind and tempt them to evil. You know, that's what I, exactly what I did. It was awesome. I just did it. They're all evil. We, we control that place. I just created a bridge so that sin and death can go over there. And they're, they're going to be going back and forth all the time. And so we did it. We, that's, we won. Touchdown. And all of the fallen angels. Right, so he, he gets instead of, sorry, let me back up. So instead of the rhetoric that rouses his troops that we see in book one, uh, you know, instead of a million uh, swords going into the air to say hurrah, we have hissing, you know, the, 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 the sound of a, a crowd booing and hissing. So the, they're hissing. He, he looks to see and Satan realizes, oh, they're hissing because they've all been changed to snakes as well. And they can't change back. They're all serpents. They're all totally under God's control, been turned into serpents as some sort of ironic punishment. Then Satan realizes that he himself is a, a serpent and can't change out of it. So, um, so he he goes. The progress is from this martial hero that we see at first, that we have to temper with where he is at the end. Okay, so we this is not not where the story does not end well for Satan. Um, so, one ninety two to two ten is uh, is the. Um, the simile we looked at last week. I won't go over that again. Um, in addition to his his course, Satan's course going downhill, his rhetoric becomes more obviously flawed as you go through. We won't have time to pick those spots out, but do look for it. And and again, the the slides point to some speeches. Um, and then. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is in terms of perspective on Satan is this question of hope in hell um, is, uh, you know, hope never comes that comes to all. Uh, so one one fifty nine sixty nine. Um, there's also this notion of darkness visible that we talked about. So um, also think about, let's say there's no first of all, there's no hope in hell. OK, so that's an important part of what is hell despair is hell okay and again think about this as it's a myth so it's, it's operating like an epic with characters that we're supposed to in some ways take as literal characters that are moving like satan is literal character that's going and, and doing things and, and battling and or not battling but also as as almost an allegory for our psyche right so if, if we are in hell it's one way in which that manifests itself is despair. Now, what is despair is, and we see this in some of Satan's speeches, is, is this notion that it can never get better. It can only get worse. Falling, being fallen, the experience of being fallen is to always be falling, okay? So it's not as though, okay, well, I'll get used to it. You know, like, uh, well, it's hot in here, but, you know, after a while, you know, like hell's pretty, it's toasty in hell. But after I find, you know, you get you get kind of used to it. You know, you wear loose clothing. Sometimes there's a fan, you know, you get used to it, you know. So it's not like that. Like, it's going to be worse tomorrow. There's going to be something that's worse. So you especially get that in some of Satan's speeches in book four. But so so watch for that. Um and then also, that's the experience, too, in the opposite direction of being unfallen. So people will also also say, you know, heaven must be boring, right? So for the Miltonic imagination, it's not boring because being unfallen means always to be rising. It's going to get better all the time. So there it's a question of hope, 
Okay, so hope and 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 the other, I think, key message of the poem is love. So hope and love as being these overriding, overriding uh, kind of virtues that guide one's actions and aspirations. So thinking the best of others, uh, hoping for the best for others, hoping for the best for, and knowing that that's having faith in that happening for oneself. That is a unfallen perspective that sees always things getting better, right? So uh, that can be kind of, the way I phrased it can be kind of, let's say, bastardized or simplified into kind of a pessimism versus optimism. And there's something to that, but it also has to do with the fundamental faith in, a fundamental faith in the goodness and a, a divine will behind things in, in, in kind of this Miltonic Christian hope versus despair as being totally cut off from divine will, okay? Um, so yeah, so I'll skip over a couple of these slides that talk about Satan's rhetoric and how powerful it is. As I said, it can be, you can see it from a couple of perspectives. Um, and uh, so I think maybe let's turn to this speech if we can very quickly, 242. <clears throat> so this is uh, Satan again. Um, is, is this the region, this the soil, the climb, said then the lost archangel, this the seat that we must change for heaven, this mournful gloom for that celestial light? Be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right, farthest from him is best. So farthest from him is best. Whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme. So, so Satan's saying that, okay, is this where what we've had to exchange for heaven? So be it. If to be farthest away from that guy is where we need to be, because because um, if he's sovereign there, we have to to find our dwelling as far away from that. Who we have to find our dwelling as far away as possible from someone who our reason equaled, but only his force made supreme. So he's saying that, Satan's saying that uh, their, their reasoning, their reasonings and their reasons for behind their, their move were equal to any claim he had. So their, their justifications to rule, so to speak, were as ra reasonable, as rational as, as God's claim but it was only supreme force. So it's that be the definition of tyranny. It's only a rule of, of force, not through, through some sort of legitimacy or, or rational justification. So this is what Satan's claiming, but we need to, again, poke holes in Satan's rhetoric, and we need to see how that plays out in, in other perspectives and in the action. Farewell, happy fields where joy forever dwells. So farewell, those happy fields of heaven. Hail, horrors, hail, infernal world. And thou profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor. So farewell to those joyful fields. Hail, the horrors of hell. So his, his will be to, his decision now is to try to embrace and see to praise let us say that which is farthest from god and to get a certain pleasure out of out of hell so to speak <clears throat> um once one who brings so receive your new possessor satan and well and the other fallen angels but he satan always thinks about himself right satan is so self-centered self it's pride is number one okay so satan is pride personified pride resentment Okay, so all the seven sins eventually uh, portray themselves in Satan, but, but it always starts from there. Um, one who brings a mind not to be changed. So take, uh, receive thy new possessor, me, Satan. Uh, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or, uh, or time. So remember, we talked about the, that kind of resolve 
of Satan's mind, which can be seen as a as a romantic hero, heroic um, moment of mental resolution and introspection, but can also be seen as pride, really. Um, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What that's a so that's a famous line. Okay, so I want to want to zero in on that. Uh, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. I wonder, for those of you who've read Hamlet, um, um, bring back kind of a Hamlet notion there of, of, of the powers of the mind. Uh, what matter where if I be still the same and what I should be all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater. And what, what does it matter if I'm still the same and, and what I should be and, but, and just less whom the thunder hath made greater, okay? So again, it was only that force and the thunder that made him better than me. Here at least we shall be free. So I want to, so freedom is very important to Milton. So is this freedom for Milton? So he's free from, he thinks, first of all. Um, but is he free to, to be his ultimate, what he, what he should be? Or is, is this the freedom of the, the heroin addict? Or is this the freedom of the tomato plant to languish, right? The other thing is, is not really free. We find out, you know, God's allowing every one of these movements. He's allowing him to, to um, heap damnation upon damnation. He's, uh, the narrator says something like, uh, Satan lifted his head and, and was not able to lift that head had it not been from, from the, the divine will allowing it, so to speak. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, here we sh at least we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here for his envy will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice tis, to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Okay, another famous line. So, um, so we'll be safe here. It's not as though uh, God has not created this for his envy. I, he, God's not going to want to go and take this back. You know, he's not going to say, oh, boy, that's a really nice place. I, would, I think I want to control hell now, too. This is Satan's logic, right? So Satan's logic is, you know, God's just controlling up there. He's going to let us be down here to do whatever we want. Um, he'll not drive us hence. Uh, here we may reign secure. Uh, and in my choice, to reign in, is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, okay? Remember the, what that reminds me of, too, is um, remember famous lines of Achilles in the, under, in the underworld in the Odyssey. Better to, be, better to be for Achilles had the opposite view, right? He had the view that he would rather serve in the, in the world above than be the ruler of the underworld. Okay, so Satan reverses that, and it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Okay, so Achilles had said he would rather be a serf to the lowest person in the realm of the living than be the king of the underworld. Okay, here Satan, uh, Satan reverses that kind of epic logic. Um, but wherefore let we then, our faithful friends, the associates and co-partners of our loss, lie thus astonished in the oblivious pool. So, but why are we allowing our partners to lie uh, kind of lifeless in the pool? Let's rouse them. Let's wake them. Let's get them going. And call them not to share with us their part in this unhappy mansion or once more with rallied arms to try what may be yet regained in heaven or what more lost in hell. So let's wake them so we can figure out what else we can do. So maybe it's to, to uh, can be what can be regained in heaven. Like maybe we can battle again and regain some sort of foothold there or what more we can lose of our souls, so to speak in hell. Okay. So go. 
back here. So I'll go back on this notion of free will. So choice is all important in Milton. So this moment of choice. So um, both Dante's uh, Divine Comedy and The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. Okay, so I haven't talked about that much, but it's, it's, it's one of the epics is probably approximately in terms of, of, of time, the one closest to Milton, the one that, that he might have had uh, ringing in his ears, so to speak, most uh, most immediately. It was written in the 15, uh, late 1580s, published 1590, the first edition by Edmund Spencer. It's English. It's about an Arthurian romances. Um, it's quite a long epic, uh, uh, six long, long books. Um, and in that epic, as in Dante's Divine Comedy, they start with moments of individual choice okay and consequences flow from that and you get this sense of there are a million paths and only one of them is the right one okay so we first meet Dante Pilgrim he's wandering in woods and lost in, in mazes uh, mazes of this these woods lost so that again is a figure of the soul lost in in choices you know and 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 only one choice is the right one to stay to the right path but there are many temptations that can take one uh, into error in every direction so too with with spencer okay so it begins with with someone with with one choice to make and it just leads to error for the rest okay now the the movement of Paradise Lost is kind of the opposite. It's, it's, it's a world where everything's available to them. There's only one choice that's bad, okay? So, so before, you know, one choice is good and there's all these possible dangers, you know, of, of the mazy woods. Here it's a garden with one choice that's wrong and can we avoid it, you know? And then the other thing to, to keep in mind is how it moves, the actual story doesn't start with the choice. It zeroes in on the choice in book nine as the, the climax. So we go from, we start in hell, we go up through chaos to, to heaven. Um, and we, we then see the see Eden, angels come to describe uh, the past to Adam and Eve in, in Eden on earth. Uh, and the movement of the narrative comes to starts from the cosmos, hell, chaos, heaven, and then zeroes in on this moment of human choice is all important. Okay, so it's a it's a real way of really magnifying in on that choice and seeing it as meaningful, as as extremely important, as 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 the heroic topic. Okay, so Milton at the beginning of Book Nine says that um, other epics have been, other poets have written these epics about martial heroism, about wars and about jousts of knights or, or this battle there about that battle there. Now it's time for him to turn to a topic, not less, but more heroic, he says. This, this topic of, of our choice when tempted or, and how we deal with it if we fail, you know, these types of things. So the her heroism of Adam and Eve is not less but more heroic than the heroism of Aeneas or Achille Achilles or Odysseus, okay? Um, there's that question about what knowledge is. I'll just kind of close on that as a way of kind of closing up our discussion of book one. And as I said, we, we've had a kind of chance to go delve into a couple of the, of the quotes very quickly. Just one second, Jerry, and I'll let you jump in. Um, we, we had a chance to go into some quotes and then look ahead about how it would apply to other, other uh, topics. But just this last point on knowledge for Milton is, is that uh, knowledge is not forbidden. It's the, not, the, 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 fruit, the forbidden tree of, 
uh, the fruit of the forbidden tree is really leads to the knowledge of what it is like to fall away from God. It's knowledge of, of good only gotten through evil or good only achieved through, through absence of, of God. So it's not as though any knowledge is forbidden here. He, Milton uh, celebrates modern science and the angel says, yeah, you should feel free to ask these questions and that type of thing. So it's not as though knowledge is forbidden for Milton. It's the question of, let's say, our attitude towards knowledge. Is it human positive knowledge without a directiveness to the divine? Or is it one that helps guide us to, to let's say, a hopeful relationship? Again, if we think about unfallen versus fallen, does it lead us to a sense of, of hope and love and the divine? Or does it bring one down to, to, to focusing on, first of all, focusing on pride and oneself. Oh boy, look at me. I solved that equation and I'm master of this. And this, I'm, I'm master of this force called nature. And, and then ultimately to this kind of despairing view of the potential of the cosmos. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll close there on that point. Jerry, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, in the lines of the paradise lost, when Satan says uh, they can't eat fruit of, from all the trees, and all they can, why is that? It seems like it's weird. They said all the trees are seem like the knowledge tree, while the, the all the fruits are knowledge tree from the knowledge tree, so that they can't eat all the fruits from the knowledge tree, and the trees are like boundaries. You know, can you refer to a line number, Jerry? Because I'm not quite sure I understand what line you're referring to. Uh, it's on the nice of the Paradise Lost, nice chapter of the Paradise. Oh, Lost. Par book nine, book nine. So oh, book yeah. Nine. In book nine, Satan says that they could uh, that Eve can eat of all the of all the fruit. That's what you're saying. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, so Satan, that's part of the temptation. Is in book nine, Eve uh, is discussing with Satan in the form of the serpent, right? So just like in Genesis, that's so. This is kind of we're we're getting the backstory of of why a serpent came in, in Genesis. And it's really Satan, and Satan has assumed the form of the serpent, and uh, the serpent says, you know, uh, starts talking to Eve, and then Eve goes, oh, I didn't know you could talk, you know, it's like one of those jokes, uh, uh, you know, uh, someone, someone's, there's two sausages in a frying pan, and one sausage says to the other, <laughs> the other boy oh, is getting okay. hot in here, and then the other one says, oh, a talking sausage, and then, so first of all, Eve says, oh, I didn't know you could talk. And then uh, he goes, yeah, yeah, no, I've been, I've been eating over here at the tree of knowledge there. Well, you should try it. Yeah, I know it made me really smart. And then, uh, and then uh, Eve said, oh, we're, we're, we're allowed to eat from any of the fruit except for that one. So thanks, but no thanks. And then he goes, what? No, no, he didn't mean that. No, you can eat from all these, you know, basically. So that was what he was doing. So Satan was tempting her and he was saying, you know, well, and he says, well, he just doesn't want you to get smart. He's, if you eat it, you'll, you'll be smarter than God. That's why he doesn't want you to eat it, right? So does that make sense, Jerry? Uh, yeah, yes. But uh, I have a question about Eve, too. After Eve has eaten the food, he seemed like he wanted to keep his position, uh, keep Adam close to her. He, he didn't want to be replaced by the God. She said, well, after God found out I eat the fruit and uh, he, he would replace me and uh, put another right. Eve to Adam. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I'm, and again, I'm glad you're pointing these out, you know, because we, we didn't have time to go through those, those segments. But this is a good example of what happens in the fall. So in the fall, uh, Eve, Eve's first reaction is jealousy and fear. Okay, so they live so blissfully together, right? Without fear, without jealousy. So that's what their unfallen state. And then as soon as she ate from the fruit, their, her first emotions were jealousy. You know, what? Oh, my gosh. 
Oh, he can't know. Oh, I better hide it. So actually, so the first thing is secrecy, right? So secrecy and lies, you know, I better hide it. So, so he doesn't know that I ate from this tree because, you know, I'll be, I'll be in trouble and then he'll want to get rid of me and I'll be replaced with a second Eve. And I can't even think about that. So even though they're the only two humans on the planet, right, there's still jealousy in their fallen state. So, uh, so that was her reaction was one of, of fear and jealousy that she'd be replaced. And, um, and they, uh, Adam comes and Adam comes and eats the fruit. So, and the, it's, it's out of a spirit of love, right? So their, their, their ultimate save salvation is when, uh, so let me back up. So Adam eats from the fruit they immediately fall to bickering and arguing, okay? So they argue and bicker, your fault, my fault, whose fault, right? So, well, you ate it first. Well, you gave it, you left me alone. Well, you, the serpent said something. And then, and then so blame game, right? And then, and they're arguing and neither wants to yield. And Eve, and in some cases, I think you could make a case for Eve as the hero, okay? So Eve is the first to kind of yield and say, sorry, okay? Let's try to see what we can do about this. And then that softens them both up. They both uh, begin to try to be constructive. And the end of book 10, they have these lines that are repeated, and I won't remember the lines exactly, but let's go on bent knee and repent and ask for forgiveness with, from God. And, and those lines are repeated twice in the, in the last bit. So, so all that to say, your original question about jealousy there, about Eve's reaction. Eve's reaction is part of our fallen reaction. So we have these fallen reactions to everything. Like we have re re spurred by pride, which are what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to me? Oh, uh, what if I get replaced? Oh, that would be bad for me. You know, and it's not thinking about Adam and it's not thinking about how she should try to repair her relationship with God or anything like that. And but Adam and Eve are not totally fallen like Satan. They have, they have hope. They, they have experiences of being unfallen. They fight. They can be selfish. But they have hope in as much as they repent, as they love one another, and as they try to help each other through the tribulations that is this life. Okay? So that's kind of the ultimate moral at the end. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Any other questions there? No, thanks. Well, thank you very much, everyone. If there's no other questions about this epic, I'll remind you next week, um, we have uh, assignment number three due. So your, your research essay on Paradise Lost. And we'll be reading a short, short poem. This was a long poem. So, uh, so I understand if not everyone got everything read. But um, for next week, a, a very short poem called Tinter Nabby by William Wordsworth. And that's what we'll be discussing in class. So have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.